Hello, beautiful human. You made the right choice by clicking on our interview with Brendan Yuri Panic at the Disco. Six studio album out right now. It's called Pray for the Wicked. And uh, this guy, love him. He brings such an energy to the studio. Yeah, I think you're really going to enjoy it. Please leave your honest feedback in the comment section below. And subscribe if you can. It would mean a lot. And we have a podcast link in the description below. Okay, Brendan Yuri, Panic at the Disco. Enjoy it. It's a good one. Let's do this. Zach Sancho. Hey. 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 Yeah. You guys yeah. upgraded, dude. This is sick. <laughs> hey, Brendan Yuri from Panic at the Disco is here. All right, all right. All right. What's up, guys? Pray for gals? The wicked. <laughs> yeah, buddy, always. Six studio <laughs> album, man. Yeah. Hey, at what point in life did you realize you can sing? <laughs> I don't know. My mom used to make me perform for like family members and for church and stuff. I remember one time uh, we had a family reunion and I was like seven years old. And my mom made me learn this song with a cane and a top hat. It was like, my mother told me I should never tell a lie. It was like very, <laughs> very Broadway. You know? Was it in that moment you realized that one day you'd be in kinky boots? No, but I, looking back now, I go, ah, it makes so much sense. You know? Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dressing in drag and the whole bit. Because when you first joined Panic, yeah. you weren't there to be the singer. They needed a guitarist and you ended yeah. up kind of replacing somebody. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I was just a temporary uh, fill-in, yeah. Your vocals have gone on to really kind of pave their way in music history. <laughs> Thanks, man. And I think th this last album totally just showcases it. Oh, that's awesome. It's thanks. sick. Yeah, thanks. Biggest difference between Death of a Bachelor and right now. Oh, this geez. era of music. It's it, Well, it's been so crazy. The last two years were so eventful. Politically and personally, I just there was so much going on and and I felt uh, you know I said this last time too. It's just like an ongoing thing, which is really cool I guess, but it's exponentially grown since the last couple of years. I just feel feel like a, d a different dude because I I challenged myself. I almost canceled Kinky Boots. I almost didn't go at all. Like the day before, I called my manager Scott. I was like, "Dude, I'm having a serious anxiety attack. I can't breathe. I think I shouldn't go. I'm just. I'm gonna fail. This is gonna be terrible." And then he had to basically talk me down and say, "Dude, it's not about you. This isn't your show. You're going to contribute something else. Get out of your ego." And I was like, "Ah, oh, you're right." So once I got over that and just kept failing and missing cues and missing marks <laughs> on the show, then I felt really great though that I did it. You know, I was really happy. Is that what fueled your inspiration? Because you wrote this album while doing Kinky Boots. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of it, yeah. What? I did. Was this a first time in a while, at least for you, that you feel like you were you felt like you were failing at something? Yeah, no. I mean, I feel like I fail all the time. Every time <laughs> I walk into a room, I feel like the dumbest guy in the room. Which isn't to say it's like the most self-deprecating thing, but it's just true. I feel like you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not worthy. You know what I mean? I walk in, I'm like, ah, whatever. <laughs> but it, I just want to hang out. Yeah, exactly. It's very Wayne's World. Yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't have too many expectations, but I do like to keep my hopes a little higher than I used to because I. Uh -huh. It just wasn't fun, you know, when you keep your expectations low and you just land in the same spot. It's very comfortable all the time. You're never disappointed. It's like, I like getting disappointed all the time. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> kind of why? why? Does that motivate you to work harder, try harder, be different? Absolutely. Yeah. Every time I fail, I go, well, it can't get any worse. So let's just keep going. I got to, <laughs> I got to get better. I got to get better. Got to improve. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's definitely like a, a motivator. When you're setting up a room to make music, you say, you just said a lot of times you're the dumbest guy in the room. Absolutely. I might not agree, but when you're setting up the room, <laughs> for you to make music in what is your role what do you bring to that um so i'm basically engineering producing and facilitating a lot of stuff but i have to give a lot of credit to my friends jake sinclair and Susie shin because they they delegate a lot of the stuff that i can't when i'm working mm -hmm. um i tend to not want to step on toes i tend to let every idea fly until it just doesn't work and jake sinclair is a little more decisive in the sense that he will tell me directly if my song is bad, <laughs> which is awesome, nice which I'm really, yeah, it's just yeah. a good friend to have. I have no yes friends, you know? Uh, well, what are you walking into that room with? Do you have lyrics ready to go? Do you have s some songs fully fleshed out? Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll have just a beat, you know, I'll have like, a, like a, for, for instance, we had, for Say Amen Saturday night, I had a, an instrumental that I had taken from a band, Budos Band. We asked them if I could use their song Aphasia to sample it, just the chorus, the horns. It's an instrumental band. So I, I used that sample, made like a little trap beat around it, kind of, <laughs> and then um, just started singing this line. It was different lyrics back then, but it was like a, a very triumphant thing. And So it started with that, then my friends came over, and we had had a previous conversation the week before, and they had written all these lyrics about my verbal vomit that I had had. So that was basically what happened. I feel like that time. happens a lot for you. Oh, you I'm, even right now, I'm just verbal, verbally vomiting. All, <laughs> but does no, that you play into your ADHD? Because sure. You, you stopped taking medication years ago. I did, I did. Uh, well, kind of. 
Do you sit, what do you do? I smoke weed. Oh, like a month. Yeah, yeah. I'm, it's a game changer. Oh, isn't absolutely, it? dude. I'm, mm-hmm. That's why I'm calm right now. But, <laughs> how does the, yeah, yeah. This is calm. This is calm for you. This is calm for me, dude. Trust me. You don't want me not high. <laughs> when I tell you that I get you, it's so scary. Uh, same thing. Right. Yeah, Started totally. on Adderall medication when I was ten years old. Yep. Took it forever. Yeah. Um, s- sativa, game changer. Yeah, right. <laughs> but how do you do that with your voice? Do you get worried? Uh, no, not really. No. I. Um, do you train? Like, how, how do you keep the muscle? Yeah, warm ups. Warm ups are good. I definitely train. Broadway taught me a new thing, mm-hmm. where I put a paper towel on the tip of my tongue and I pull my tongue out of my mouth while I warm up for wow. like thirty minutes, thirty to forty five minutes. I pull it out. Like here, I'll show you. You go like this, right? You go. Like that's one, and then you just go up like two octaves, three octaves. You keep going until you can't. Wow. To me, that sounds like nothing, but to your voice and to a real professional, yeah. that's yeah, yeah, apparently be... it works. I mean, it does. I'll tell you, it works. It's yeah. really wild. What do you... sings weird? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like it's gibberish. It's so weird. <laughs> what do you learn about yourself from being in Kinky Boots and doing eight shows a freaking week and getting up there and killing it? I have more respect for myself now. I definitely do. And that comes with, like I was saying, just accepting the challenge, jumping in head first, not really knowing, flying by the seat of my pants. I kind of knew the show. A couple times I missed, you know, cues, even toward the end of it, of my run. But it, it taught me, to, yeah, just don't give up. Don't just say no because you're scared. Mm-hmm. If you make decisions based out of fear, they're probably not going to be the right decisions. And you'll be so regretful of them later. <clears throat> so that definitely taught me that. But Broadway's a different monster, man, because I, I didn't know that most people who come in from the outside, like a, a, a musician or somebody else from not Broadway, when they come in, they usually only do like three to four shows a week. Yeah. No one told me this until like a <laughs> month into my run. And I was like, so I could have been chilling. I could have been like sleeping half the time. But I, you know, it was awesome. It was a really grueling schedule. I have so much respect for Broadway and, and cast and crew and everybody. It's, it's such a different world. People could never fully understand unless you're around it all the time. I want to shift gears to dying in LA. Yeah. Uh, this song, I don't know. Like I, I really, I felt like you were inside of my brain. It was scary. <laughs> yeah. Where are you, and and how does that song come to be? And are you just reflecting on your time? To- just tell me about it. Yeah, that one came about from uh, my friend Morgan Kibby, who, if you've heard of, she has a group called White Sea Music that she does White Sea. And um, she's written, she was a part of M83, so she's written like countless like synth stuff. She's such a talented writer, lyricist, just vocalist. She's amazing. And she had these set of lyrics, basically. Um, I came into the studio, we went down to like Ocean Way or United or something where where, like Sinatra had recorded and we were playing like Elton John's piano. So I went in there, I was like, oh geez, (laughs) we better make a good song. She came in with the lyrics in it, and she said, I don't have a melody, I don't have, uh, I don't have no pentameter, I don't know what it's going to be, but here's some words, try to make sense of it. And so she put them down in front of me, we just started piddling around. She said, play your favorite chords. My favorite chords are like Bruce Hornsby, like changes, Tupac changes, you know. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. <laughs> so I started playing those kinds of chords, um, and then it just sneezed out. Within like 10, 15 minutes, maybe the song was done. It was just wow. like reading through a journal, and it felt so right. We did one take of piano, one take of vocal, I planned on replacing them, and I never replaced them because it just it sounded and felt right, like the emotion was there. You know, it, it, you cool. feel it. I mean, every yeah. face on the boulevard is a dreamer, just like you. Yeah, that's a man. That one hit when I was singing, and I was like <laughs> in, intermittently trying not to cry, like holding in things because some of those lyrics, actually all of them, but some of them hit a little harder. Where I'm thinking about that, like walking down Hollywood, mm-hmm. walking downtown, looking at all these people. These people dream just as big as I do. I just happen to be fortunate enough to have landed in the place that I am. That I do not want to. Let it go. So I'm going to service it as well as I can. Try to give as much as I can. It's the best I can do. But that's that realization is so big, you know. Like everybody, we're all so much more similar than we think. Like we're not that different. We're a bunch of humans. I say that a lot. I think some people understand it, and then a lot of people, you know, they just they don't necessarily get it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you dream still? Oh yeah, big. Never. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What are dreams? Yeah. What are dreams? (laughs) <laughs> Why did you end the album with that song? Because the whole album is high energy, go, 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 and then it's like... That, se- that seems to be my thing, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. The last one we ended with Impossible Year, it was like really right. sad. Um, I tend to do that. And the album before that, I ended one with a song called End of All Things. What a depressing title. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, I, I think I like just to have that juxtaposed. You need like a contrast, at least I do, where every song is so high energy, everyone's, you know, kind of a danceable one. 
that I, I like ending a little morose. It's a little sad, you know. We just we put out a video with a puppet, and the whole time it's really crazy. <laughs> yeah. But the very end, it's just like dark, you know. Like the guy throws the puppet on the, another pile of puppets, and it's yeah, like we're all dead, just bro. puppet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so sad. Dead puppet pile. <laughs> well, where does that come from? Does, does that come from inside of you? Yeah, yeah. Well, that that video idea did. I when I finished that song, basically like had it arranged at my house. I invited my friend Brandon Dermer, who directed that video. I invited him to the house. I was like, Hey, I have a, a song I want to show you. And as I played the song in the background, I just described the video to him, basically how it ran out, like how we shot it. I just said, I wanted to be a puppet. He, maybe he does this. Maybe he does this. Maybe there's a dominatrix. I don't know. Maybe we do this and this. And. Yeah, he basically tried to fit as many ideas as we could in two and a half minutes. I mean, that puppet is literally you. <laughs> yeah. But is that based on any His sort forehead's of- not as big. His forehead's <laughs> not as big, I will admit, but yeah. Did you use Ed Sheeran's puppet guy? Uh, I think we did. I think it was the same oh, guy. Really? Yeah, it might have been. It was the people that did Avenue Q and a couple oh. other people that jumped in. So I, it mm-hmm. might be similar people. I'm not sure if it's the exact same company, though. Has there been a moment in your life where you could finally go, hey, mom, look, I made it? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Th- The first time that I returned home after we made our album and I played it for my mom with all the swear words intact, (laughs) it was, it was a moment of like, Hey, look, you know, we can tour on this now. I think that's like, we've made it, you know, that's all we want to do. It's not like we, we didn't know about the music industry. We didn't know anything else about that, but we had learned from other bands that took us under their wing that tour was where it's at. You know, like you just tour, man, that's where it's at. It's so fun. They're not wrong. Like I live to perform. It's, it's better than drugs. Absolutely. (laughs) Is it better than the studio process? I think, yeah, in a different way. Um, studio is great because it's so introverted. You're, you're just so locked in your own head. It's really cathartic. Um, But then live performing is cathartic in a different sense. Songs become new meanings. uh, There's a different vibe. The energy is completely changed. And I get a bigger high from performing live than I do from the studio. So when you have this new body of work and you're about to tour with it, what goes through your brain? Are you ready to, like, at the beginning of this whole cycle, the songs start with one meeting, but, like, they can come out completely different to you and absolutely to everybody else listening absolutely any song can do that I mean they have in the past I wrote a song called girls girls boys that was about my first threesome when I was 16 years old wow. it completely changed when fans took it as it doesn't matter if you're gay straight mm-hmm. bi pan trans doesn't matter you know religion race create whoever you are you deserve and have an obligation to be happy and be loved that is the coolest thing ever. They took something that was personal to me that I was dealing with and changed it into something that meant something bigger for a, a mass amount of people. That is so beautiful. Making a change that's bigger than me is like, that's now it's an end goal. That I've seen that firsthand, it's like, that's what I want to do. But it's you everlasting. Know? Absolutely. But do you go into the creative process differently now knowing that's what you want to do? Or do you continue just to be yourself because Yeah, I still create selfishly, like <laughs> just for myself and then hope that you know, it's worked that way so far that I write for myself without thinking, how are people going to perceive this? What is, you know, what are their opinions going to be of it? It's not until the album comes out that I go, okay, tell me exactly what you think. Love it or hate it. Just let me know. But uh, yeah, I, it's pretty selfish, the process when I do it. If we were to listen to one song on this album yeah. and really get to know you, what song would really give us the best idea of who you are right now? Uh, King of the Clouds. That's like uh, that was, <laughs> that's the that's the most verbal vomit I had done. <laughs> where the next week, my buddy Sam Hollander showed up with a laptop, and he was like, "Dude, you were so high when you were telling me this stuff. You didn't realize I was taking notes for like two hours, and then I turned it into a set of lyrics where I was talking about Carl Sagan and inter, interdimensional travel and multiverse, <laughs> and like it was just great, like quantum theory stuff. It was really crazy. What gets your mind going with that? Like, you, you really want to time travel? Oh, I mean. I, uh, time travel, maybe not, but I, I love the idea of like interdimensional travel. Okay. Like I'm watching Rick and Morty and like all these shows, you know, thinking about just possibilities where different timelines, different timelines. Yeah. That's so hilarious to me that there would be a me that didn't do the band that was a land surveyor or was a, you know, cosmetologist mm-hmm. or was just a, you know, whatever. I don't know. That's, it's so interesting to me, you know, that we do dictate to a certain point or do we dictate our fate? I don't know. I, I understand really what you're cool. saying. Yeah, yeah. I don't, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but dope. <laughs> Fates manifest destiny. Yeah. Carl Sagan. Yeah. <laughs> what are we doing with your money? Are you going to, are you going to be that guy who like invests in a, uh, you know, interdimensional travel. You're gonna have like, a company like 20 years from now. I just got a Tesla. 
Whoa. Oh, nice. So I'm on my way to, to space travel. You're already on Saturn, bro. <laughs> and then You're the next in. is I'm going to get the flamethrower. No, that's crazy. <laughs> How crazy is that dude that he's selling flamethrowers to civilians? <laughs> this is like, this is speaking of multiverse and different timelines, this is like the other timeline in Back to the Future 2 where Biff is like the president oh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. essentially Donald Trump. And you're like, what the? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy. It is a scary time that we live in. It is. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel obligated for, you know, our reality to come through in your art? Or is it solely? selfish and solely you um, I like my music to be an escape but I also like to use my celebrity as a catalyst for something greater you cool. know so I could I could use my time and effort and money to go to something that I do firmly believe in you know human rights campaign or or something like that you know is, is pray for the wicked a way of touching on politics without actually singing about it a little bit sure I mean there's so much wickedness and and you know Politics has changed. I think the definition of politics has changed so much even now. It's just, it's like how magazines in, in the UK are now, they still call themselves magazines, but I just call them gossip rags because mm -hmm. they just become like tabloids mm -hmm. essentially. So it's, it's a little similar, but um, I, I don't know. I'm not too political. I know that I don't like assholes. I know that mm -hmm. when Donald Trump says stuff, he has a platform and he's using it for no, no good. That's not okay with me. Mm -hmm. You're you're trying to take out humans. That's not okay, and and incarcerate children. That's weird. So are you telling me you have a sense of morals? Because I <laughs> wow. think that's really weird. Yeah. I guess I do. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, no. <laughs> you have a basic moral compass. You understand what this country's been founded yes. on and what makes us freaking great. Yeah, I believe in stuff. Yeah. Since the dawn of time, <laughs> yeah. it's nuts. Whoa. Whoa. Uh. Where am I? What dimension am I in? <laughs> different, we, timeline, are, different timeline. Different timeline. Different <laughs> timeline. <Yeah. laughs> I am so sorry to interrupt the interview. I'll just be real quick. Get Quip. It's the best toothbrush out there. I'm obsessed with this thing. It sticks right to my mirror. It's timed out perfectly, so I always know that I'm brushing the right amount. They send me refill heads like every month, and that's not just for convenience. It's for my health. Plus, Quip is an amazing toothbrush. It's electric, and it starts at only 25 bucks. $25 for really the best toothbrush you will ever buy. I got it for Dan, Heather, my mom, my sister, my dad, Oprah, uses this toothbrush, so why shouldn't you? Quip, seriously, it's the best. Go to getquip.com slash sang, and you're going to get a toothbrush starting at 25 bucks, and your free refill pack will follow. That's right, you'll get something free if you go to getquip.com slash sang. Try out the Quip toothbrush, you'll love it, but I really want you to tell me what you think. So use it and get back to me. Getquip.com slash sang. Okay, back to the interview. People like to say you should find the silver linings and things, and you come out on the albums right off the front. You're like, nah, f that, f that. Why, why just start the album with that song? Yeah, that's a lot. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's like 15 times or something. Um, we bleeped out the last one though. You know? I know that there you go. That was, that was yeah, weird. We were laughing so hard when we did that in the studio as a joke. We just kept it. No, that one. It's that, essentially the message of that song is nothing's ever good enough. Don't let anything ever be good enough. You know, because everybody's like, oh, but the silver lining is, oh, but look on the bright side. It's like, no, 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 no. I want it to be better. <laughs> this is, we can make it better. But see. That mentality, there's a silver lining, is something that has plagued our humanity sure. of like, okay is just fine. Right. Mediocre is where we stop. Right. As long as we get to the next day, we're cool. Right, right, right. No. 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 <laughs> we need to jump on this now before we become a, a, a terrible place to be. Exactly. <laughs> what about the lyric, quick charade, Beyonce, lemonade? What? Is it? what? <laughs> right? Love I it. just heard <laughs> Future say, Michael Jackson, Thriller. And I was like, oh, dope. So I'm not alone. Yeah. No, I, I, that was, <laughs> dude, I, <laughs> during that, in the studio, we were kind of saying it like, um, my buddy Jake was like, is there, I mean, do you want to, you've always said you wanted to like name a celebrity in a song. Like you wanted to say Marilyn Monroe instead of Miss Jackson in your song. And I was like, yeah, that'd be cool. He's like, well, now's your chance. So we just, I was like, well, who's queen? You know, <laughs> Beyonce, mm -hmm. Lemonade. That was, that was just fun. We were bouncing around. Honestly, this whole album was like that. It was just fun to do. It, it wasn't like, like it. a, yeah, it wasn't like a, a chore. We weren't working. I was having friends over. We were having conversations about Carl Sagan and random stuff. And then. Once in a while, we would go in the studio and like do an idea. It was cool. Do you feel lucky that you get to create music that way? Because absolutely, my assumption is that it's been very different in the past. Sure, and I sure. know a lot of artists either get you know four songs or forced in camps and forced to work with people. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, the songwriting camps are really interesting. I did that for a year or two, or maybe it was like a yeah better part of a year. I tried that for a few times, um, but I. Yeah, it's a struggle. Like, I know some people work really well that way. Um, I work better when I'm, like, relaxed, having just laughing so hard with my friends. It just makes it 
I don't know, more honest in a way. That that's it. It's more genuine. Yeah, more genuine. Yeah. D- Dylan France is a pretty funny guy. Dude, he <laughs> he's a, a character. Weirdo. He I love is it. such a little punk, man. He's so funny. I I love it's that dude. Best he's the best. Describe. Yeah, he's such a punk. <laughs> But, but you really get to call the shots. Like, this is your canvas, and it's yeah. yours to paint on and do whatever you want with it. Yeah, luckily I do have friends that, they're not they're not yes people, so they will be totally honest with me, but they do allow me to a certain degree um, to create what I feel I need to, which is awesome. Do you think that's a, do you ever think how crazy it is that your life, like, you know, at one point you're telling your mom that, just as long as we're touring, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now look at you, you're six albums in, man. I know. You sell out Madison Square Garden like nobody's business. Dude, I never thought, I never thought when this band got started that I would be here. That, that Like, no way. There's no way. You know, I couldn't have predicted that. Um, I think we assumed we would be in a van for <laughs> 10 plus years, you know, doing that for a long time. But you were okay with it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all. There's no shame in it. That's where we were excited to be. We wanted to be in vans and just touring the country. But now now that I've seen more and more, I just get more excited about, well, what else can we do? I don't know. Let's see what more trouble we can make. I don't know. How do you measure success at this point? Oh, that's tough. Uh, it's subjective, obviously, for everybody. For me, it's it's like how happy something makes me. How pleased am I with the product? How much did I have to struggle with it? Because again, like the failing is part of that. If I don't fail enough, I feel like, you know, maybe not as successful. It's it's more like I feel rewarded for having struggled so hard with something and then come out on top. You know, I get that's, it. It's cool. Yeah. But what keeps you going when the struggle might get too tough? It, do you have like an? What is it? Um, I just love what I do. I, I think you have to have a passion for it because if you don't, obviously people will see through that, you know, if, if you're faking it. I can't. It's too tiring yeah, right. to fake something. Mm-hmm. I tried doing I, auditions in LA, you know, faking my way through it, like plastic smile, like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. I'd <laughs> love to be in your movie, you know what I mean? <laughs> but then I just can't do it, you know? Um, and that's not to say that nobody should audition or not become a movie star <laughs> if they don't want to, but it's just uh, I found where I love to be. I love making music. I love touring. I love performing. I love meeting fans. I love talking with people. I love seeing just... I, I, I like to travel. I like to do all these things, so f- being able to be fortunate enough to be here is unreal to me. Can pop punk come back? Yeah, I mean, why not? What does where it take? Didn't go anywhere. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm the guy who says it's kind of gone a little uh, <laughs> Soft. somewhere. Stop being that guy, I bro. Think, I think that yeah, the forefront of people's minds is what's on pop, which is hip hop now, which is awesome that it's like take this turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I guess I can't even call it hip hop now. It's like a new thing, right? There's like new genres being created. So trap or whatever you want to call it, mumble, it's whatever. It's a culture, yeah. So I think that's cool. I don't think it ever really dies. You know, when people say disco's dead, it's like nah, you can still listen to disco records. I'm sure there's like mm-hmm. niche stuff and cults where you can go and, and do your disco thing. Yeah. But I want more. Like, dude, emo nights are huge. Yeah, that's I fun. I love those. Yeah. yeah. I met Tram Sam Grannies the other night in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Dude, yeah. piano bar, singing my heart out, <laughs> sins not tragedies. Oh, man. that's the best. Felt it. And but <laughs> it brings the community together. It brings yeah. a whole generation of people together. It totally does. And I and I've met people through the pop punk emo scene who aren't a part of it at all. You know, there's like um I met uh, you know, Logic, the rapper, mm-hmm. Bobby is the coolest guy ever. I got to hang with him a few times, got to see his show. And he, and we were just like fans of each other. So seeing that from someone who, from a totally different walk of life, totally different genre, um, to reciprocate a fandom is like the coolest thing ever. You know, I'm mm-hmm. just like, man, I'm such a huge fan of yours. I'm a huge fan of yours. It's so genuine. Yeah, I think it, it should never really die. Also the power of music, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Your music really had, I mean, still has major saturation, but back then, I've told the story. I remember seeing it on my friend's old fatback Mac computer. <laughs> oh my gosh! What was the last time of the first time you put on makeup? But also the last time. First time I put on makeup, yeah. I was a kid. I was home. We, we, we used to make home movies, uh, me and my siblings. So I was probably six or seven years old. Sorry for that fart noise. Yeah. <laughs> I liked it. it doesn't translate well on a microphone. But the, the compression adds like some power to it. <laughs> that was terrible. I apologize. Well, you, you put it on. Do you feel something different? Um, I put it on. It was just like fun, just experimenting as a kid. And then I ate my mom's lipstick because it tasted delicious. <laughs> wow. I, I don't know. <laughs> At the time, I thought it was amazing. It was like those uh, wax lips filled with like root beer or whatever. Okay. You, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. And how long after that do you actually like put it on and like show yourself? Oh, um... Yeah, with the band. The first time we did it was for stage. We we did our first headline tour with a uh, dance troupe 
a touring dance group called Lucent Dossier. They're like a gypsy, hippie, Cirque du Soleil type deal. Cool. Um, yeah, that was our first headline tour. That's when we first started doing it. And I, and I was like, well, I've been called the puppet, you know, to Ryan, like mm-hmm. Ryan's puppet, whatever. So well, I'll just make myself a puppet. So I started doing that for the circus tour, like make myself a puppet and Ryan's ties back puppet. into this thing. Yeah. <laughs> you like well, it, it, was, it, was our, it was our inside joke. Like okay. we, that was our thing. It was like funny, you know, that I was being controlled by, you know. I have to do whatever. I'm does. seeing that photo. It was a gold jacket I think you were wearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm seeing it very vividly. Dude, that was from Gangs of New York, man. Oof, we, nice. we got to pull stuff from movies. It was very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How's Sarah? She's great. Thanks for asking, yeah. Dude, always the best. checking in. Have we, uh, Appreciate it. How's uh, everything going well at home? It's great, dude. My <laughs> dogs are still maniacs. It's awesome. Cool. My my dog, Bogart, just celebrated his birthday three days ago. Aww, happy birthday. Happy late birthday, Bogart. Yeah. He doesn't know. He's an idiot. He's, <laughs> it's okay. They're your it's children? Good. They are my little kids, yeah. Do little they, fur babies. Do they listen to your music? Oh, they hate it. Oh, <laughs> no, it's no. so funny. We put on certain <laughs> records and they'll start barking to it. They don't They don't react to mine. I think they just know that it's me. But when I've been on tour, I think like four years ago, my wife showed me a video of us performing live and there was like a live multicast thing coming out. So... So she was. She put on the live performance on her laptop, and uh, my dog Bogart was just sitting there, like, "Why is why is he so small? I know that's dad. Like, why isn't he home? That's so weird. Like trying to touch the screen and stuff." Uh, dogs are the dogs best. are so, oh, I love so cute. I love them. What did your mom think of this latest album? I was thinking that like, you you grew up in a Mormon household, and I this did. is very. This are you religious now? No, 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 I'm not. There's some religious undertones to the album. Sure. Bit. Yeah, I wanted to bring that back because I I had to come to terms with the fact that. That's such a big piece of my history, mm. such a big piece of my culture, my childhood, that I can't deny it. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to ever forget where I came from. It doesn't mean I have to follow their rules. It doesn't mean I have to be a part of their religion. I can pick and choose what I want from it. You know, I, I used to think that I was stuck in this way that no, I, I'm either anti-theist or I'm whatever. I don't care. So I have to now realize that it's okay. You can really do whatever you want. And I just want to be nice to people. Yeah. I want to be kind and a good individual. And so I pick and choose the things I like from the culture and kind of dismiss most of the the doctrine. I get it. Yeah. But what do your parents think when they hear this? Oh, they loved it. But we've we've been so good for so long. Like the first, I think I said this last time, but the first time that, you know, I told them exactly who I was, what I felt, I was going to do the band, no college. It, It was maybe three weeks that they weren't down with it. And then when I, it finally blew over, like took them three weeks, but we came to to grips with who I am and they were like, we love you. Like, why are we (laughs) freaking out? We're so proud of you. You seem so happy. Why would we deny that? Dude, they put you in that top hat real early (laughs) in life, man. (laughs) This is your fault, mom. (laughs) Yeah, totally. This is, yeah. Roaring Twenties, by the way, one of my favorite songs in the album. Roll me like a blunt. I want to go home. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Where's home right now? LA? Yeah, I, I live here. I've been here for 10 years now. This is it forever? I... I love L.A. L.A. devotee. L.A., that's right, man. Even, you know, dying in L.A., man. Hopefully, you know, hopefully I'm here till then. But I, I just, I, I love it out here. It's the best and worst place in the world, man. Yeah. It can it can be your saving grace or your total downfall. It's just, it's such a cool area. I don't know. It's just, there's so much going on here. So many amazing people. The fact that I, it took me like 15 minutes to just come down and hang out with you guys is also really nice. <laughs> but it's, that, that makes us happy too because yeah. then you're like stressed. <laughs> exactly, yeah. House. Yeah, it's always a good hang. Why is High Hopes after Hey Look My I Made It? I feel like they should like be opposite. <laughs> maybe they maybe they should have. It just sounded better that way. Okay. Just the, Honestly, it was a sonic decision. It was like, oh, I think this one will be cooler after that. I feel like it's like a perfect story. Like you had High Hopes right. and then you're like, oh, look, we made it. And chronologically, you're totally right because it yeah. should be High Hopes and then Hey Look My I Made It. Exactly. And but, then dying in LA. Yeah. But <laughs> Maybe the high hopes can now just be a reflective of like, you know, I made, like, hey, it, I made uh, it. Now let's get nostalgic, you know? Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. We'll yeah. go with that then. Yeah, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If you were to describe this album yeah. as like one story or one chapter of your overall story, uh-huh. what would like kind of be the, the one liner on it, the description of it? Oh, man. In a world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It's it's kind of, I mean, really pray for the wicked says it all, but it's, it's mostly just... Um, you know, is it ever good enough? No, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep running for that top, dude. That top rung, rung of the ring, ring of the rung. I'm always just searching to see how far I can take things. So really, it's just. Um, I don't know. Ostentatious is a good word for this, I guess. What, um, a lot of it is. What about a Grammy? Oh man, that would well, be great. You know. Yeah, right. Dude, I think so. I mean, that'd be awesome. I think you were robbed last year, dude. I think EGOT 
would be awesome. Ooh. Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. But I'm not committed enough to, to acting, you know, so I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Hey, you still got life left, my friend. There's plenty of time, right? That's right? it? Yeah. Look at you. I feel like Broadway performers, once you do Broadway, you can literally do anything. Oh, I hope so. Oh, it's so physically demanding. Are oh, you it kidding? Is. It's such a grueling thing, man. It's, it's awesome. It's, don't get me wrong, it's the coolest thing I've ever done, but the most challenging thing it's so grueling the schedule the everything the hitting your mark the acting the singing the it's nuts would you I, write your own musical oh i'd love to yeah absolutely oh, that'd be cool i would love to i've actually i've talked to a couple of people about this i had a, a, some a, some amazing meetings while i was in new york i won't say names because it's still talking to them but some awesome conversation yeah. about like really fun ideas it's a hot trend right now yeah. Spongebob. Yeah. I know. <laughs> All these people writing oh big, big songs you, for big musicals. Dude, that's, that musical is really good, by the way. Ethan Spongebob. Is, I've never seen it. I just watched videos it's online. so good. So Ethan Slater is the best. I love that guy. I think you should be a Disney character. I think that's what you're missing. You need to like voice it, write it. So voice acting is the thing. I, as a kid, I wanted to do cartoon voices all the time, man. That, that That's the dream. I mean, right? And that's the best gig because mm-hmm. you just Easy. do it from your house and mm-hmm. you're chilling. I think your possibilities are endless, <laughs> Brendan Yuri. Overpass kind of has like, the beginning is like a cartoon police kind of chase. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that where that came from? <laughs> no, we, I, I said I want to do an Ocean's Eleven Steven Soderbergh, like, you know, like, uh, yeah, Ocean's Eleven, basically, okay. soundtrack. That's kind of what I felt like. I was like, yeah, they're looking for something. Robbing a bank. Yeah. Pray for the Wicked, six Wait. studio album, courtesy of Panic of the Disco. It's out now. Last question. We got to go. I want to run oh. real quick. Yeah. There's a video online of you singing I Read Sings Not Tragedies, and you say, hate this song is that tr- <laughs> is yeah, that true no that's trolling the crowd okay it's the funniest thing because now kids come up and they just go why do you hate that song and and i now i just steer into the skid and i go well because it's the worst right <laughs> but but it's funny i've never hated that song it only has gotten better which is really bizarre yeah. every old song now when we play it like i think i was saying earlier just takes on a new meaning and when it does that i find a new appreciation what does it mean for you now Oh my God. Well, now I look out and see the kids. I'm seeing younger fans come. It means rejuvenation. It's like, whoa, there's a whole new like mm-hmm. wave of younger kids coming to the shows that have that didn't even know about that song 13 years ago, you know? And now they're discovering it for the first time. It's like a rediscovery. It's it's just, it's amazing to see that. Their excitement that, uh, that we had at the very beginding of it. That's... It's just, it's nostalgic. It takes me back. It's like, whoa, that's awesome. The right music is timeless. Oh, I appreciate that. That's hey, really did you, cool. Did you paint the cover yourself? No, that's a, a girl, oh, Rosanna. I wish I did. I know. I'm a terrible artist. Oh. <laughs> like, I would have I messed it up. But it's a very cool, like, abstract thing. That's essentially what we said. We took that on top of uh, Watermark Tower, actually. Our friend Chad um, manages that hotel, and he was like, hey, I have a helipad you can take a picture on. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. Helipad. Oh, my friend uh, manages a helipad. Yeah, yeah. no big deal. <laughs> Pray for the wicked. Yeah. Listen to it. Oh, mm-hmm. please. Hey, Brendan Yuri, thanks for hanging out, man. Dude, it's always yes. a pleasure. Thanks, you. guys. You're the best. You guys are awesome. We love you. I love you guys. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. If you did, please subscribe and also check out our podcast. There's a link in the description. And also comment and like and do things. Other interviews are on the screen somewhere. So click them. Thanks for watching. <laughs>